Hello everyone, how are you? Hope you're doing well. Thank you very much for joining us this uh, Friday afternoon UK time. My name's Carl and I'm here to do a live webinar about TEFL as a digital nomad. This is a live webinar, it's not pre-recorded. Um, so please, if you've got any questions, uh, please do put them in the chat about, te about digital nomads, about TEFL, about anything that's all to do with English and foreign language. And please also let me know where you are in the world. I can see people already saying they're from, there's someone in Morocco, hello. Uh, Captain Wahid, hello sir, in Germany. Uh, Mariam in Morocco, Catherine in Cardiff. Oh, I love Cardiff, one of my favorite places I've ever lived, Catherine. Uh, Celia in Arizona. Uh, there's people all over the place. Hello, I'm Carl, I'm in Northern Ireland. Um, I work in Northern Ireland as a TEFL trainer. So if you do any of the practical courses with us at the TEFL org in Northern Ireland and sometimes the Republic of Ireland, because I sometimes cover that area, you might spend the weekend with me teaching you how to be a English and foreign language teacher. I have been lucky enough to have lived in many places around the world, uh, Japan, China, Vietnam, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Iraq, uh, Sri Lanka, um, did I say Japan? I think I did. Uh, I, I also have worked a lot in Spain and Italy and I live and work here currently in Northern Ireland where I work as an online teacher and also an online examiner of English. So any questions at all, please do put them in the chat. I will get to them sort of after I finish my um, presentation about digital nomads. And um, or if not, Alan, who is monitoring the chat, We'll say hello in the, and put a link in or something like that to answer your question maybe a bit more quickly than I can. Right, let me get going with TEFL as a digital nomad, okay? Um, let me see if I can just share my screen. There we go, we got it up. So, first thing I want to say is that I have never been a digital nomad. OK, so I am maybe not the complete expert on being a digital nomad. However, I have done aspects of being a digital nomad from my spare room. I mean, office, not spare room, office um, in Northern Ireland here, uh, which I, I think and I hope link up well if you are thinking of being a digital nomad. The other thing I want to say is that the rules, a lot of digital nomad revolves around rules about finance and rules about visas. It is currently, as you watch this webinar, the 13th of January, 2023. If you watch this in six months time, if you watch it in two years time, it might be different, the rules and the, the countries that offer digital nomad visas. So you need to sort of check whenever you watch it. Okay, just that's the sort of terms and conditions I'm putting in at the start of this webinar. Right, so TEFL is a digital nomad. Firstly, what is a digital nomad? Because when I started doing TEFL 20 odd years ago, uh, there was no such thing as a digital nomad. So, um, it, you know, it's it's something that has sort of, I think people have done it for, for a little while before, before even COVID, but it is something that has become a lot more apparent during COVID times, I think. So in my opinion, and please, if you disagree or you agree with me, please do put it in the chat. A digital nomad is someone who can work from any location, who can do a job from anywhere in the world where as long as they've got a computer and a laptop and, and Wi-Fi, internet, they can do it, all right? So that's what I think a digital nomad is, basically. Um, sometimes it can be sort of seen as a remote worker, but it tends to be a remote worker that can change countries. They can go to different places. Um, I think the common theme is that it, you work online, basically. If you're, if you're someone that's got a job that can work from anywhere and you do it online, basically that means you could be a digital nomad, I think. And a lot of it does come down to people who are freelance, that kind of thing. We'll talk about that in a second. So that's what I think a digital nomad is. But as I said, please, if you've got more information, do put that in the chat there for me. Right. So it tends to be a freelancer, and this is why I think it's good for TEFL. I have been a freelancer since I stopped working for the university that I was an academic uh, lecturer for about, oh, probably about seven years ago now. 
So what that meant means as a freelancer is that I have done lots of different types of jobs in TEFL. So there's a college up the road just for me there and I do some face-to-face -face work for them. I also have my own business where I do online teaching. I also um, work as an, a TEFL examiner where I either grade writing papers or I grade um, people as they speak. I also do some proofreading for people and I help people with academic essays. So I do lots of different things within um, EFL and I don't work for just one company and I work and some of the work I don't work for anyone. It's all work that I have found myself. So that tends to be what a freelancer is in EFL. And that might be something that you could do. I'm pretty sure I could do my job in, you know, I'm in Northern Ireland. I could do my job in France. I could do my job in India. I could do my job in Australia. I could do my job in South America as long as I've got good internet connection. But I have seen people that are digital nomads and then actually work for um, uh, work for companies. So if you've got a company that uh, gives you the uh, guaranteed work online and you can do that anywhere and they don't mind if you do it anywhere in the world. I think that that could definitely be something that you could do as a digital nomad. OK, so it doesn't have to be sort of your freelance. So. It could work that a company or a university, an EFL company or a university could pay you to work for them full time and they don't mind where you are. You could maybe do that in a different country. You could be a digital nomad that way. OK. Right. So when people do contact me and they ask about doing it, becoming a digital nomad, um, I, the, the, the first place they often ask me is where can I do it now? I have sort of done Google searches on this and and I've looked at the, the date when the website was published and that has always changed yeah so uh, so the dates change and then the country's listed changed depending on who's writing it so six months ago the list was different from what it was a month ago for example so don't take this as the only places where you can do it yeah because there are lots of places around the world where you can be a digital nomad and next month a new country might list next month a country might take away the digital nomad all right so europe is a quite a big market for digital nomads there's lots of countries that are trying to attract digital nomads it's very good for countries to have digital nomads they get the people tend to be young so they tend to not have so many sort of health problems that kind of thing um or close to retirement um they tend to, you know, uh, want to spend money locally, that kind of thing. They sort of want to be up for it. So it's money that a country can get coming in quite easily. So a lot of countries are really up for it. Now, these are some of the ones that are listed as at the moment as being a digital nomad. Now, each of them have different requirements. So what Croatia need is different from what Iceland needs. And they would have different requirements in terms of generally the finances. They want you to be able to prove that you're going, you can live there and you can work there and you've got enough money coming in, basically. So all of these might be countries that you, you fancy the look of. OK. And as I said, it might change all the time. Yeah. Now, I've left this one till last because I think this is quite a special one at the moment. Georgia actually has one of the fastest growing economies in the world right now. I've been to Georgia I, and I love it. I've also been to lots of places on this list, but not all of them, but many. And um, I love Georgia. Georgia is a fantastic country. And I also think that um, it's also got lots of work there in country as well. So I would sort of think about Georgia if you can. Yeah, I think Georgia is a great place. So that's Europe. And, and you know, some people might say George is not in Europe, but I'm, I'm listening it with Europe there. Uh, right. Rest of the world. Again, these are some of the countries that offer it. And again, each of them have different requirements to to do it. OK, so, you know, going to be in a digital nomad in Indonesia and Bali and, uh, you know, Indonesia and is a really popular place to be a digital nomad. Um, you know, is 
is, 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 is a really popular place to go, but the requirements that they have in Indonesia will be different in terms of the amount of money you will need compared to the UAE. So these countries will either want you to have a set amount or they will want you to be able to prove that you can earn a certain amount every month. Okay, good. Please, look, if, you, if you want to ask me any individual country questions about this, what are the requirements? Um, I, I, and I, look, I can see already people are asking me about Spain, for example. I'm saying these, this isn't the whole list. Changes all the time. I couldn't fit the whole list onto the screen. So if you've got a country in mind that you really want to go to, then I, I think, it, you know, do a bit of research and see if they offer a digital nomad. The other thing to be aware of is maybe that these countries offer a work visa. So they could offer you, for example, a working holiday visa, like something like that happens in Japan. And although it's not a digital nomad visa, it's basically a visa that allows you to go there and work there um, and they don't really care as long as you got the money coming in. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a digital nomad visa for you to do it, but it, you could just go in on a normal work visa. But some work visas are linked to a specific country within a company within that country. Some working visas, and they tend to be called working holiday visas, that um, that means that you could go there and they don't really care what company you work for. So obviously it sounds amazing. You know, if I was um, 20 years younger, I would be mum and dad, I am off. I have got myself a digital nomad visa for Portugal. See you later, alligator. And my dad would probably say something along the lines of, hold your horses, what you're doing? Why don't think about it? Just stop a little bit, all right? You know, don't rush into it. I think that, you know, digital nomad is a great option. For, for lots of people, but you've got to do a lot of research. In it. There are steps that you need to do first before you do you before you even apply for the visa. OK, some specific steps. And the first thing that you've really, really got to get in mind is the finances. So you've either got to have and be able to show that you've had set money coming in behind you for the last sort of year, two years, whatever it might be, whatever the country decides to do, or that you've got a contract from a company to say that they will pay you X amount of money for the next 12 months. Or you need to be able to show the government of Germany, for example, that you have a certain amount of money in the bank before you go there. So quite often that means, you know, taking screenshots and or sending in papers of um, your bank account with ten thousand dollars in five thousand dollars in whatever the amount is that the country wants to show that you've got enough money going forward to, to live in that country so you've got to have some sort of money in the bank or you've got to have some sort of proof of wages you can't you know you can't just do the get the digital nomad visa and worry about the work afterwards. You tend to need to have to have the work and a bit of work in history in the bank before you can go abroad. Yeah. The other really key thing that I would be really, really thinking about if you were a digital wanting to be a digital nomad is know your outgoings. So, you know, know how much money you've got you know, hopefully you can sort of cut all your ties with your home country and you haven't got any outgoings going. But more importantly is know what your outgoings are going to be when you're there. Because, you know, the cost of living in Dubai is different from the cost of living in Portugal. So you've got to know where can you sleep? How much is it going to cost you? What sort of money do you need for food? Do you need to buy health insurance? All that kind of thing is stuff that you need to know. Research, research, research. Location research is key. Don't just research about generally being a digital nomad. Do some research about locations. You know, what's the internet much? Well, first of all, how much will it cost to live there? I think that's really, really key. You know, go on Facebook groups, go on websites, see how, look on, look on like housing websites to see how much it will cost to live there. What are the visa conditions? How much will you need to be earning in order to get that visa? Can you work anywhere? 
um, you know, just check that really care. What's the internet like? I work for some companies where they have a minimum speed test that they want me to work for. So I have to, every six months, prove to them that my internet is of a certain speed in order for them to give me work. Now, I have a wired connection to my computer here in Northern Ireland. I know that if I slip onto Wi-Fi, the speed goes down sometimes quite a bit, sometimes not so much. I know that I have quite a good regular uh, internet connection here, but I have lived in countries around the world where even with a wired connection, the internet is not that great. So, you know, check the internet of where you're going and check if that's going to affect the sort of work you're going to do. Something else to think about is what are the time zone implications? Yeah, you want to go work in South America, fantastic. If you then have a job teaching Chinese students, how is that going to affect you in terms of the times you're going to be teaching? So really, really careful, look at the time zone implications. And I really, really think you need to have a backup plan. What happens if you lose that job that has promised you that you can work as a digital nomad for the next 12 months? What happens if that company goes bust? One, do you have enough money to get yourself back home? No problem. Fantastic. Great. Or two, will you need to find other work? Yeah. Have backup plan and maybe a backup plan to the backup plan. It does sound amazing. I don't want to be a negative Nelly. It does sound amazing. You can be your own boss. I work here as a freelancer and generally on the whole, I can be my own boss. Now, I do take up contracts with companies where they say come teach for three months for us online. And then I'm not really my own boss because I've committed to them for three months and they have certain hours where I need to work. But on the whole, as a freelancer, I can pick and choose when I want to work. I can work different roles and I think this can work as a digital nomad, basically. You know, you could be a TEFL teacher. You could be a TEFL examiner, maybe. You could be a proofreader. But also you could work as an accountant if you've got a bit of work, if you've got a bit of background in that. You could work as some digital marketing for people. You could be a copywriter. There's lots and lots of different roles that you can do with it, yeah? You can also meet lots of other really cool, I think, people as you go. You know, there's lots of communities. Although digital nomads, by definition, are on their own sort of working, there's lots of Facebook groups of digital nomads where they say, hi, I'm a digital nomad in Bali. Can I meet other people? Yeah. Uh, you can have a really flexible lifestyle. You know, you can move around a lot. You could go live in cities. You can maybe go live in live by beaches again if the internet's good that kind of thing there's no commutes wow amazing you know when i've had jobs in london where i've had an hour-long commute it's an absolute nightmare okay you can also obviously travel to lots of different cultures now the thing that, that you know obviously if you want to travel around europe and you go to different places as a digital nomad fantastic it's great obviously when you move countries there are costs associated with it that kind of thing but as long as your company or the customers you have are happy with you moving around, boom, get to see big chunks of the world. Fantastic. Is it realistic? I first of all, I want to say is when you sort of type into Internet, into Instagram or top tick, TikTok, whatever, or be is that be real? Is that the latest one? I don't know if, no, if that's something. Is that something? I don't know if that's something like Instagram or TikTok. I've just got my head around TikTok. Um, when you type in digital nomads, they're quite often good looking, sexy people that pretend to be digital nomads. It's, you know, I've met lots of TEFL teachers in the years I've been doing it. Not that many of them were super sexy. Some were, but not many of them were. Don't believe, oh, you know, look at me. I'm a digital nomad. Look at me on my beach. This is, these are my lovely tanned legs. Look, as I'm teaching um, the, my students in China on my laptop with a pina colada looking out to the sea. Firstly, a lot of beaches have terrible internet. There's no way you'd be able to do that. Okay. That's the first thing I think about when I look at that. You know, when you see people doing it out the back of the van, you, you know, they might be doing it, but they've got to have a really good, strong internet connection to do it. Okay. So don't fully believe. Yeah. But 
do look at blogs that give two sides. There are lots of really well balanced blogs of people that are digital nomads, not in TEFL and not in TEFL, that give both sides. You know, this is great, but this is terrible. This this is really easy to do, but this is really hard. Look at the balanced blogs and see if it works for you. Okay. Digital nomads is a growing situation. Every month, another country probably adds itself to the list of places where you can go. So I think it's here to stay. And I think it could be as long as, you know, as long as people are still up for it and people still want to do it. I think it's a growing situation in the future that could definitely work out for many, many people. People do do it now. Not necessarily people that, um, you know, look good in a bikini or look good in their swimsuits on Instagram. You know, ordinary TEFL teacher people do do it around the world. Yeah. And countries want it. Countries like it. So what are the steps to becoming one? First of all, I think you need to build up your business. So, you know, I've done webinars about how to be a freelance EFL teacher. It involves setting up websites, contacting students, taking the money, all that kind of thing. Watch my webinar that I've done on that. It's on this Facebook page. It's on this YouTube page. It's on this LinkedIn page where you can find me talking about it and answering questions about it. Yeah. Learn some marketing skills. I think to be a freelancer and to be then a digital nomad freelancer, you've really got to have strong marketing skills in order to get customers through the door as an online teacher um, to get them paying. Yeah. Um, research, look at other jobs. So, you know, if you can be an EFL examiner, what do you need to be an EFL examiner? What, you know, what fits that criteria for you? Um, you know, research jobs that are sort of guaranteed and will work, you know, we'll give you a six month, 12 month contract, for example. We have a job center on our website, tefl.org, go to jobs at the top, you can see jobs that are online, start working for them, see how it works. Start budgeting now. Start to be sort of realistic about how much you're going to spend. Start saving money if you need to um, save some money for the to show that you've got the, uh, the, uh, the cash in order to do the visa. And then the last thing that I want to say about Digital Nomad is could normal TEFL teacher give you what you want? So a lot of digital nomad contracts, so visas are for a year, two years, but they, you know, you can, you can um, extend them. Um, if you, uh, if your job is to, if you're, if you're getting into TEFL to travel, that's all you want to do. And I first got into EFL because I wanted to travel. I didn't get into EFL to be an EFL teacher, to be a director of studies, to be an examiner, nothing like that. I got into it because I wanted to see the world and my one of my first proper jobs was in Vietnam and from Vietnam I worked in Ho Chi Minh City but I got out every weekend to beaches I got out to um, uh, I got out to other countries I flew to Singapore I flew to uh, Malaysia I got the bus to Cambodia so I was a TEFL teacher with a guaranteed job in Vietnam but I was still traveling around. I was still seeing lots of the world without any, you know, problem about having to find my own students and that kind of thing. Now, I'm not saying don't be a digital nomad, but also think could be a normal TEFL teacher working abroad for one school or one university give you exactly what you want. OK. Thank you. I'm going to uh, uh, get um, to these questions now. Thank you. Please do keep the questions coming in. It's so lovely to see people all around the world. Uh, Manchester, you know, it can be sunny in Manchester sometimes, but then someone below you, Cat S, is from Los Angeles and someone's from Jamaica. You know, uh, there's a bit of a difference in Manchester. Although I'm in Northern Ireland, the weather's terrible there. Hello in Devon, Leeds, Birmingham, Trinidad and Tobago. Wow. Hi Haiti. Canada. Wow. Well, there's people all over the place today. That's amazing. Um, lovely. Right, first question. Let me see the first question. I think was Jill. Um, uh, Jill Linney Matthews. Hi there. Um, right, you're in New York and you're doing online lessons of a hundred. You did an online course. Is that what you mean? Or that? Yeah, I think you're doing an online course of 120 hours. 
Uh, will you ever learn all the grammar terms? Nope, I've been doing it for 20 years and people still hit me with grammar terms, I don't know. You speak well with a college degree, but you're doubting yourself to learn grammar after 40 years, right? The first thing I would say to you, Jill, is that as a TEFL teacher, you are not expected to know all of the grammatical constructions and terms of the English language, okay? You're just not. So what, what I always say to people that I'm training is that when you start teaching English as a foreign language, you don't teach the students all the grammar all at once. There are very common themes that come up within textbooks. Past simple, present continuous, past continuous, past perfect, present perfect. Let's say about 10 different tenses that come up quite a lot. And once you've taught it, you if you know, right, okay, this week I'm going to be doing the past simple at intermediate level. You get your textbook out, you learn all about the past simple intermediate level. You teach that lesson about past simple and intermediate level. That's now in your head. Your next lesson might be the present continuous. So you really don't need to learn all the grammar at once. You just need to learn it step by step by step as you teach. And that's all you need to do. Do not worry about the grammar. The other thing I would say, Jill, is that grammar is not the be all and end all of EFL teaching. Vocabulary is as maybe more important than grammar in my mind. Teaching vocabulary is quite different from teaching grammar in terms of what you as a teacher need to know. There's also skills teaching, teaching writing, teaching speaking, teaching listening, teaching reading. And that, how you would teach those, you don't need to know lots and lots of grammatical terms. So don't worry about it, Jill. Just what you need to know as you do in a 120 hour course is the basic, the structure of a lesson and just a general idea about what grammar really is. Okay. Good luck, Jill. You, you can do it. You can do it. Uh, Mo, Mo Salah, is that, or Mo, just Mo? Hello, Mo. Um, I'm guessing, I'm pretty sure Mo Salah probably has got enough money in the bank to get become a digital man. Uh, you just completed your TEFL qualification and got your certificate. Can TEFL help me find a place abroad? So, I mean, I, I don't know what you mean by that as in terms of, um, can they actually find the job for you? Now, if you did your qualification with us, TEFL.org, if you've got your qualification with us, we are here for you, Mo. That's what I would say to you. There's lots of different ways to contact us if you need help to apply for jobs, that kind of thing. The people that handle all the contact with the customers are amazing. They are fantastic, right? Um, the first steps, you know, Mo, if you've got that, is to look at some of the, the webinars that I've done on how to write a CV, how to apply for jobs. But the basic thing is if you've got a good quality TEFL con uh, certificate from a well-accredited company, you're going to get work and basically you just need to start applying and make sure that your application is on point, basically, Mo. Um, but yeah, if you've done, look, we're not going to do the interview for you. We're not going to write your application for you, Mo, because that's not how life works. But if you've got your qualification with us and you are struggling, contact us, Mo, for sure. We are here for you. Uh, Neo, hi, how are you? Um... Neo Motapelli, I think is how you say it. I'm not sure. sure. Sorry if I said it wrong. Right. Does one need a degree? You have a diploma. Uh, right. I've done webinars about teaching abroad without a degree. To be a digital nomad, uh, countries have different visa requirements. But quite often, the only visa requirements for being a digital nomad is to show that you've got money in the bank or you've got money going forward. If you want to be a TEFL teacher and go and work abroad, a lot of countries do want you to have a degree, but not all. And I've done webinars where I talk about that, Neo. You know, there are countries and it's got nothing to do with the job. It's got it's to do with the government of those countries deciding whether they want people to come in or out without a, who do not have a degree. That's what I'd say to you, Neo. So, you know, a, a and a degree can be in any subject. And the degree tends to need to be three years. But again, countries have different requirements for the degree. But generally, on the whole, if you've on the whole, if you've got a three year degree in any subject, you can pretty much and a TEFL qualification, you're pretty set to go and work anywhere around the world. Anyway, 
There are rules about native speakers, non-native speakers. Don't get me started on that. That drives me crazy. I've done webinars on that as well. But, you know, I don't know about your diploma, Neo. Your diploma might count on a degree level. You can go check. Okay. Good luck, Neo. I love that name, Neo. What a beautiful name. Um, hello. Uh, let me find the next question. I'm just scrolling down through all the lovely, lovely questions. Some great talk about Georgia there. Georgia is a great place. Honestly, I really do recommend you uh, go there. Uh, Amy, let me see if I can highlight your question at 4.12 p.m. Uh, I'm not sure I can recommend it. I think I'm, I'm, I can I can highlight it. Can I recommend a company to teach online for a first time teacher that doesn't tie you in for one year plus? Right. So the one year. Right. It, it's very, very difficult to find contracts for companies for less than a year. Why? Because they if you're going to go work in China, for example, and. Europe is different if you can get work in Europe on a European passport. But if you're going to go work in China and they're going to pay for your flight, they're going to train you up a little bit when you get there, they're going to pay for your accommodation, that kind of thing. They are an expect, they're expecting you to work there for a year. So that's why they're tying you in for a year. OK, now they are not going to, you know, throw you in prison after nine months if you decide to leave. But there might be financial penalties that you would happen if you don't last the year, Amy. So, for example, I've worked for a company um, when I worked in Vietnam who said they would pay me back my flight costs, my visa costs, uh, which are upfront costs that quite often you need to pay at the end of the 12 months. I've also worked for companies that will give me that cash the day I arrive in the country. But the companies that sort of hold that money for a year, they do it to get you to the end of the year. And if you get it after nine months, they give you back three quarters of the money, for example. So if this is a problem that you've got, Amy, that you don't want to last a year anywhere, I would look in Europe because European companies tend to not tie people into a year. They tend to tie people in um, term by term and but they won't pay for flights and visa costs and that kind of thing in europe so you might need to get a ryanair flight somewhere whatever it might be okay but you do need to generally have a eu passport for that okay uh i had to answer your question amy um uh tracy is the next question do i know the requirements to teach in japan uh, sorry, Alan, I've sort of lost the, the, the scroll. Alan's watching this and he's also monitoring the monitoring the questions. Um, let me see if I can find the next one. Uh, or oh, Alan, I don't know if you can help me. The screen's just sort of gone there a little bit. Um, AS. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me let me find this one. Uh, Jodens. Is that the next one I think highlighted? Yes, it is. Jodens Prince. Hello. What are the basic requirements to work as a TEFL teacher online and overseas? Right. The basic requirements is you've got to have a 120 hour TEFL certificate. So what that means is you've done a course that's well accredited, that is a good quality one, um, such as ours here at the TEFL Org. Uh, and you study for 120 hours and you get that certificate if you pass at the end of it. And you can show that certificate to companies that are advertising for online teachers and you get some work. Overseas, similar, tends to be the minimum is the 120 hour certificate, but other countries do ask for degrees on top of that because of their government saying that you've got to have a visa, you've got to have a degree to work here. So, you know, it really does sort of depend country by country, but the basic requirements is the 120 hour TEFL certificate, then maybe a degree on top of that okay they're the basic requirements to work as a TEFL teacher online and overseas um how the hell answer your question Jones I've done webinars about which about different TEFL courses that might be worth looking at yeah or send us a message on our website tefl.org if you want more information on that Jones uh, Marlena um tips for getting experience in teaching online for beginners without prior teaching experience right 
online if you want if you want to get teaching experience online the first place to start is to see if you can teach any refugees online because that tends to be free and low pressure you feel pressure when you're teaching them because you want to do a good job but you know there's no contracts involved there's no pay involved there's no money involved you know um there's that tends to be so contact churches contact mosques see if they've got any refugees nearby who need to learn english and see if you can get them all to that right the next sort of tips for getting experience i think it's just to start applying for jobs to be honest marlena you know there are lots of jobs out online jobs that sort of apply if you've got your tefl certificate just sort of go for it like look for your look for a job that's maybe offering five ten hours a week see if you can start there that gives you a bit less pressure and you know just sort of just go for it yeah i think i think that people quite often don't realize that they actually have a bit of experience of teaching again i've done webinars about how to teach with no experience and and i recommend you watch that but looking back at the past work history your part past school university education history tend to have a bit more experience there than you think okay um some people they're saying they're only moderately sexy well then you start and start I, I think if you're moderately sexy you start an instagram page uh as or tree hello i like that that's a that's a that's a it's an interesting surname and you look very dapper uh definitely moderately sexy uh, what about companies such as Preply? Is that still freelancing? Yes. So companies such as Italki, but people always tell me I'm pronouncing that wrong. But um, companies, so that is basically where you're a freelancer. You advertise yourself on a website and students pick you from a long, long list. It's a bit like dating. And they decide whether you uh, are who they want to teach them. And then the company such as Preply takes a little cut or they charge you a fee to advertise on there. Um, that is still freelancing, yes. Now, if, you can, if you've been doing that for a year and you've got money coming in from that, you might be able to show that as a digital nomad visa to say, um, you know, to, to show that you've got money coming in and that you would be a good candidate to go work in Portugal or somewhere, okay? So yes, that, is, that counts as freelancing. It's a big part of freelancing for some people. And Nina, uh or nana hello can you do this without a degree uh so basically there are tefl jobs where you don't need a degree for sure and there are fantastic teachers out there of english and foreign language that do not have a degree there are also countries that will accept people without a degree again i said i've done webinars but just off the top of my head you've got cambodia is a great place to go without a degree uh uh, Central and South America could be a good place to go about a degree. Europe, if you've got a European passport, could be a good place to go and teach without a degree. You can be a TEF teacher without a degree. Having a degree helps, gets you into more countries, gets you more options, but you do not need to have one. Now, digital nomads, again, you've got to check country by country. Quite often, digital nomad visas, all they care about is the money. The country cares about whether you've got enough money to cover yourself or you've got a work contract to show that you've done it yeah they tend to but some do say look to have a digital nomad visa you need to have a degree but a lot of them don't okay um hope that answered your question nana uh what nicola hi what sites or companies do i recommend for a tefl qualification certificate base are there specific ones required right we here at the tefl org i work for the tefl org that's the name of our company we train people up as tefl teachers and we do it we believe to a high quality so what we do is we get outside organizations that have nothing to do with us come and check our qualifications and they come and check the tutors and they come and check all of the um, materials and that kind of thing to make sure that it's of a good standard and we then can put that on a certificate that you would get when you pass you can then show that certificate to employers and say look I did my qualification with the TEFL org and look they are a good quality company because they've been checked by people that have nothing at all to do with them right 
What I would say is, Nicola, there are other companies out there that will offer you cheap, cheaper, and they say you'll get work, TEFL qualifications. If you were a student, who would you want teaching you? Would you want someone teaching you from someone here, such as the TEFL org, who has a good quality qualification? Or would you want somebody who's done a, a, a 30 pound qualification that they found on Groupon or something like that? Yeah. Beyond us, there are other lots of other different qualifications, but I honestly think, and look, I don't work full time for the TEFL org. You know, this is part of my freelance life. Uh, I really do believe that the TEFL org offer good quality qualifications that can get you work around the world. OK, so have a look at our website, tefl.org. Uh, Flexarian. Interestingly, how can you become an examiner? Right. So generally, you've got to have had a, a fair old chunk of teaching experience. A lot of companies, not all. And there's lots of different EFL exams out there. Loads and loads of different ones. Um, not all of them, but most of them want at least five years of teaching experience before you can become an examiner. Some also want master's level qualifications, not all, but some also want master's level qualifications. So being an EFL examiner takes a while to um, to get to get going. You, you can't tend to go straight into being an EFL examiner. But I do see jobs advertised on websites for examiners where you don't need to have any experience beyond just having the qualification. OK. Uh, Shrina, what textbooks am I referring to? I've, I've completely forgotten. Was I talking about textbooks earlier? Uh, oh, I can't remember. Shrina, put in the chat what you what bit more information, because I can't remember. There's lots of textbooks out there in the world. Uh, oh, no, when I was talking about the grammar and about having to teach yourself. Right. So look, there's lots of different uh, textbooks out there. And there's not one perfect one. I quite like the English file series of textbooks. But if you're going to go work for a company, they tend to have a textbook themselves that they want you to work with. So don't go out there and buy loads of textbooks if you're going to go work for a company. If you're going to go into the freelance thing, it can be useful to have a series of textbooks that you work from. I like the English file, but that doesn't mean that's the best one at all. I quite often use cutting edge for pre-intermediate and then I'll do English file for intermediate and then there's even more ones beyond that okay and there's also specific ones for exams business English that kind of thing I haven't asked you a question Sharina um, Tracy hi are students wanting to learn English more likely to take an online course or an on-site course what countries lean towards online learning interesting right I think um, Right. Since COVID has supposedly disappeared, um, uh, I think that there are, you know, there's there's people are moving back into working on site. But the market now for online is a lot bigger than it was before COVID. And I was teaching before COVID. There was a, there's a lot more people who are up for learning online than there was on site. Yeah. But. I do still get people contacting me in Northern Ireland and I say and I advertise myself as an online teacher and they say, no, I want you to come and teach me face to face in a Starbucks or something like that. I personally don't do that, but I know people that do do that. Right. What countries lean towards online learning? I think China, East Asia, Southeast Asia, but generally East Asia. So that's China, Korea, Japan tend to be big for online learning. But. You know, I will, I also get people contact me from the Middle East, you know, Tracy, I think it really sort of depends. You've got to try and find your niche and see who kind of wants to learn that niche, you know, so sort of have a look about some of the things that I've done uh, uh, in terms of setting yourself up as an independent teacher in terms of videos and things like that. I think they'd probably be quite useful for you, Tracy. OK, uh, Anna, hi, does the TEFL certification expire now? I don't think it does. And I'm waiting for Alan to tell me if I'm correct or if I'm wrong there on a private little chat thing that I've got that comes up on my screen. But I'm pretty sure the TEFL certificate does not expire. So what that means is 
Um, and Alan has completely agreed with me there. So that means once you've done your qualification and you're a TEFL teacher, you can use that qualification in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time, you know? Um, you know, the thing that I would say is if you've got your certificate and you maybe not work, don't want to work full time, see if you can find some little part time jobs just to get your eye in, get yourself going with that kind of thing, Anna. Because, you know, if I was recruiting people, I wouldn't necessarily love it if it, it had been 10 years since they did their TEFL certificate and they haven't worked in that 10 years. But no, it doesn't expire. It can last you your whole of your career. I still put my TEFL certificate down on my CV, even though after that, um, even after that, I've done lots of other master's level qualifications. Okay. Good luck, Anna. Um, well, just coming to the end, a couple more questions. Uh, Nicola, hi. Um, hi there. You've been working as an English teacher online and offline for seven years now. Fantastic. You could be doing this webinar, Nicola. I also lived in China for a year. To be honest, if you taught English in an elementary school, you're not TEFL certified teacher. Oh right, interesting. Okay, um, so um, companies gave you work even though you didn't have your TEFL certificate. That's pretty cool, Nicola. Right, um, right. One of the benefits is basically, look, I've done recruitment f for when I, I ran schools, and they, you know, if I've got someone who's been trained, first of all you know it helps you stand out if i've got someone that's been trained as a tefl teacher and someone who hasn't and they've got exactly the same level of qualifications who am i going to employ the person with the TEFL certificate also a lot of jobs that you see advertised say you need to have a tefl certificate 120 hour tefl certificate and quite often companies won't speak to people without that yeah now some will, I'm not saying that you have to necessarily get the TEFL certificate, but the ma big majority of them out there want people who've already got trained. Yeah. Um, so I that that's basically the main benefit. And then, you know, it's just, you open more doors and you can go abroad. You can apply for jobs that you see advertised now to go work abroad, basically. Yeah. Um, that might be the last question. I think we've totally run out of time. Look, I'm really sorry if we haven't got the question. I can see that there's loads there. Um, and I'm really sorry that we didn't get to it. Uh, I will see uh, over the over the weekend if I can get in and reply to some of those questions in the by text. OK, but if you do have any other questions, please go on our website, tefl.org. We've got a, a, a contact us section. Yeah. Um, and send us a send us a message we are really really happy to answer any of these questions i promise you um you can send us a message on facebook we also read all the youtube linkedin comments all that kind of thing um we also have some extra things that if you want more information for example on our website tefl.org we have a blog section and if you type in that search search engine you know work in japan you'll find information about working in japan Work without a degree, you'll find information about working without a degree. I've done lots and lots of webinars over the last couple of years that cover lots of different subjects. So it's worth scrolling through the videos, seeing if you can find those. Um, uh, we also have a, a podcast where we interview people who have taught abroad. People give lots of good information about that kind of thing as well. So that might be worth something that's worth downloading. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Please, because I'm a vain... Uh, not quite sexy individual. I like all the likes and that kind of thing. So please do like it and subscribe and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, the webinars, Claire, are on the, you're on the Facebook page. Look for the video section. Click on videos. You'll see loads of pictures of me in this room with various poses and lots of different things. Uh, please, if you disagree with me, or you agree with me, or if you didn't like the webinar, please do put that in the chat as well. We love all sorts of feedback, okay? Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.